okay? A little small company that now is a multi-billion dollar concern. And it is the foundation that people like that the gang have provided for all of us. And I think we're now positioned uh, as we go into phase retirement to reward some of these people like Dr. Yang, but also to look at the advent of bringing in yet a new crop of colleagues. And again, it is this transition that I think is very vital, very important to Howard. Uh, the president is sends greetings and his respects to Dr. Yang, and he wanted to convey that as well. So he thanks you for all of your contributions, sir. So with that, I am going to uh, simply move uh, the transition of this program to our esteemed dean colleague, uh, uh, Dr. James Donaldson, and thank him as well for all the things that he has done. Good afternoon. Now, I'm here before you tonight in two capacities. One uh, is an administrative capacity uh, as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I will speak just a few minutes in, uh, in that uh, capacity. Uh, our honoree tonight, you all know, and I sat uh, this afternoon, he didn't know I was there, I was in the back. But I heard all of the wonderful things that were said. And sometimes, you know, when I hear these kinds of things, you know, I sort of look up to the heavens. And I say, oh, Lord, please forgive this person for make, saying such an outrageous uh, fabrication. <laughs> but I should say that today I never once had to do that because I knew that what was being said really described the nature of the man. And I just want uh, him to know that we in the College of Arts and Sciences, we are delighted that you are a member of our faculty. And I say this not on behalf of myself, but on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff of the college. In fact, when I went back to the office temporarily, uh, after the tribute session, I had the program with me. And some of the staff, and I noticed that there was a stirring, you know, in the office. And they were looking, you know, at the program, and I asked, you know, what was wrong? And I think I shared this with you earlier. They thought that he had left us forever. <laughs> <laughs> and when I told him, I said, no, 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 this is not what this is. He's very much alive, and I saw him. You know, when I left, when, when I left the, uh, when I, when I, when I left the, left the, uh, uh, the meeting. And oh, how overjoyed they were to know, you know, that their fears were just not uh, really, uh, really not, not correct. So again, on behalf of the college, I want to thank you uh, with what you've done, what you're doing, and what I know you will continue to do for the Howard University community. Thank you, dear. Now, I'm going to take off this administrative hat because I want to speak in another capacity. And I want to speak as a friend and a brother. Now, he came to Harvard nearly 37 years ago. Now, I was here, you know, at the time, a uh, young person. Uh, I didn't have any gray uh, in my, uh, anywhere. <laughs> didn't have any gray. And 
I had been recruited along with my colleague and honoree here tonight as part of a group of young scholars that President Cheek, the late President Cheek, was bringing in to really move Howard University to a new level. And from the very first time that I met my good friend and brother, we just hit it off right away. Because the things that he wanted to do and the dreams and the vision he had for Howard you know, it was shared by many of the young professors and scholars at the university uh, at the time. And I can remember uh, sitting in the advisory council of the College of Arts and Sciences with Dean Robert Owens, who was a dean at the time, and listening you know, to dreams and visions you know, that those in the room had you know, for, for Howard. And I say to you that he has kept his bargain that he made to himself and to others to help move Howard to a new level. And for this, you know, I'm going to be grateful because my life, uh, most of my career, you know, has been at Howard. And uh, I tell you, I think I'm probably still alive today because I was at Howard <laughs> all these years. Because with all of these young people coming in year after year, it was just a constant stream are re-energizing uh, uh, power that we all, you know, felt. And so I thank the students, I thank the colleagues, and especially I thank my friend Yang. Thank you. Because we, we actually uh, can remember and celebrate when we were on the mountaintop. <laughs> and also, we shall not forget the times when we were down in the valley. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping uh, that uh, although the, the economy now is not good, uh, many uh, programs uh, now, uh, it's not sure where they, whether they will uh, continue, but I am sure that an institution that has survived 144 years, and I say survived, but I really should say what? Thrived for 144 years, will continue. And even this day, you know, I uh, will pass. But it will pass because of people, scholars, like my uh, friend here, and the countless others at this institution, who have a dream and who believe, you know, in the university and what this university can and will do. And so saying this, you know, I would like now uh, to end my remarks and thank again my good friend, Sue. Thank you, Dean Donaldson. Uh, next, I would like to call on uh, uh, Dr. Charles Betsy, who is the interim dean of the Graduate School. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And good evening. Uh, today I am extremely proud and pleased on behalf of the Graduate School to welcome you to Howard University as we celebrate Professor Suleiman Yang, 
I've known Dr. Yang for only a portion of the time that he's been a professor of African Studies at Howard. He was serving as chair of the department when I arrived in 1990 to chair the uh, economics department. And I dare say that neither of us could have predicted that we would still be here today a little grayer and also a little wiser. Professor Suleiman Yang easily ranks among the nations and the world's top scholars, not only in his field of African studies, but across many disciplines and fields, of, and fields of his interest and expertise. I am proud to join you in recognizing him today for his many contributions in the areas of cultural, political, religious, and social affairs that transcend African affairs to the wider world, world affairs. As an author or a collaborator on 11 books and more than 70 published articles, and as a frequent and renowned presenter at globally significant conferences, Dr. Yang has had a major impact on enhancing awareness of Africa and the diaspora, particularly related to Islam and African political, cultural, and development affairs. As a consultant and advisor to heads of state, the World Bank, and other international organizations, he's influenced policy and governance affecting the lives of millions of people. A tireless mentor of young scholars, he's fostered intellectual collaboration and encouraged commitment to humanitarian causes, <laughs> and indeed many of his former students are now themselves leaders in this field. Yet Dr. Yang remains humble and unassuming in his countenance and disposition, qualities that symbolize the best of the human spirit. He's one of those people who when they address someone as my brother or my sister, you feel that he genuinely means it. Yes. Today I congratulate him on reaching this milestone in his decades-long career, and I applaud him for staying true to his calling as a scholar, a teacher, and a humanitarian. All qualities that make him a true son of Howard in the tradition of the great scholars who laid the university's foundations many years ago. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for your service, and I wish you continued success in the years ahead. I would like to add a few words uh, and <clears throat> just say welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. <coughs> and uh, a special welcome to our featured guest, Professor Math Rui and his wife, uh, Pauline. Uh, welcome to Howard University. Um, I would also like to welcome all of those who have traveled from different parts of the country to be here. Some of you I know have been on the road since five o'clock this morning, either driving or on the train or on the bus to make sure that you get to uh, be here this evening to celebrate this moment with uh, Professor Nyang. I also would like to thank my colleagues here at Howard University. I see a whole lot of them here. Uh, who are here to share this uh, particular honor also with uh, Dr. Nyang. Above all, I would also like to thank my colleagues in the Department of African Studies and uh, our students and uh, all of those partners who over the past few weeks especially have worked tirelessly with us to put this event uh, together. Now, what I've learned over those past uh, few weeks um, and uh, was something I said this earlier this afternoon and has been confirmed just a moment ago by the Dean is never to use the word tribute for somebody who is still alive. <laughs> because uh, when I sent out the notice to uh, students and colleagues, uh, the responses were coming back in. Oh, I didn't know Professor Yang passed away or had to hear the sad news and I said no 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 nothing of this sort happened he's alive and well and I'm still running after him trying to catch him all of you so it is really a pleasure for us to be able to do this for a dear colleague for an icon for an exemplar um, while uh, as a friend of mine has said while she can still smell the roses. So I think uh, it's, it's really important that we do this to uh, our own, uh, recognize, embrace them, celebrate them, make them see and feel the kind of appreciation and love that we have for them whilst they're still around with us. Um, with that, uh, I would like to uh, move on to the other parts of the program here. Uh, next, I would like to welcome on the podium 
uh, a fellow Gambian, uh, <coughs> uh, an economist by training, but also an accomplished uh, writer, cultural figure, and uh, um, uh, a Renaissance man, <laughs> period. And that is uh, Dr. Tijan Sala, who's coming to us from the World Bank to do a poetic honor, a tribute to Dr. Yang. Tijan. Thank you very much, uh, Mbai. I'm indeed very pleased and, uh, to be here. Um, in 1989, I, I wrote an article um, on the life and works of Professor Suleiman Nyang. Uh, it was a piece modeled on a piece he had written on Professor Ali Mazrui. Nyang had written a monograph called Ali Mazrui, The Man and His Works. I was at that time teaching at North Carolina A&T University in the Department of Economics and just freshly finished my PhD and, uh, and started teaching. And uh, in that work, I uh, sent it to Nyang. He was pleased with it. I sent it to Professor Mazrui. I don't know whether he, has, he remembers it. What I called, that many call Nyang the younger Mazrui. <laughs> and Professor Mazrui reacted and he said, uh, maybe Mazrui is the older Nyang. <laughs> I think one of the, the remarkable things about Nyang is he has the gift of the gap, both in terms of ideas and in terms of uh, 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 how he interacts with people. And Mazrui uh, has been known also uh, in his writings to have never written what they call a dull paragraph. I think it's important for Nyang to know. I, uh, I came to know Nyang in 1982. That time I had just was about to finish my bachelor's degree. And uh, they used to organize here in Washington at uh, Johns Hopkins a program called Model OAU, the Organization of African Unity, done by Michael Nwanze. And Nyang used to be invited to speak. We met. I, being a Gambian, I was quite um, uh, impressed by this uh, Gambian intellectual, and he became a sort of mentor to me. Uh, so during my undergraduate years, and later on when I went to graduate school studying economics, he would write to me letters, send me encouraging letters, copy articles he has written, send them to me, uh, send me photocopies of proverbs, of local uh, wall of proverbs, and so on. And I use some of these in my own writings, and so on. <coughs> and began to continue to admire this man because of his selflessness. You know, the Wolof in Senegal and Gambia uh, have a saying which goes like this. They say that nit nitai garabam, that is, a person is the medicine of another person. And I think what is impressive about Nyang is that he has lived his life selflessly. He has lived his life selflessly. And he has done this almost to his own poverty. He has lived almost a life of deprivation. Any money he has, he gives to organization, helps young, young African students, mentoring them and so on. And this is incredibly remarkable because many of us are very selfless, selfish. And many of us, we, I mean, we are trying about accumulating and looking big and trying to impress others of what we've accomplished. But Nyang is always concerned about others and what can he do to help others. And this to me is a remarkable thing. You know, in the, among the Wolof, they have a saying which says that Ludud Yalla Nenla, whatever is not God must be ordinary. Whatever is not God must be ordinary. People may be very smart, they may be very wealthy, they may have a lot of power. But after all, they're just human beings. And I think this is some, a lesson that Nyang has always had. He always <coughs> carries himself with humility. And that has to, to, to me uh, been uh, very amazing. Nyang grew up in the Gambia, first starting in a rural area in, in Pase, you know, where he went to school, first primary school. Then he moved to Banjul, which was the capital, the capital of the Gambia. In those days, it was called Bathos. 
and went to a school called Mohammedan School. From there, he went to St. Augustine's High School, which was in those days, there were five high schools in the Gambia, and St. Augustine's was, was one of the elite schools under the British system in the Gambia. He went to St. Augustine's. And finished at St. Augustine's and came to the U.S. in 1965, around the time when Gambia, as a country, became newly independent. In 1965, Gambia got its independence. That's when he came to the States and went to Hampton Institute, which now is Hampton University. And there he studied under a professor by the name of Edward Coleman. He studied philosophy, learned the writings of the Greeks, you know, and the medieval thinkers, and the Enlightenment. From Hampton University, Hampton Institute, he went to University of Virginia, where he studied public administration. From the school founded under the tradition of Booker T, he went to the school founded under the tradition of Thomas Jefferson. From University of Virginia, where he did his PhD, he came to Howard University. And he has been totally committed to Howard all his professional life. He has had opportunities to go to teach at some of the most world-renowned universities with big box offered to him. No, he has been consistently devoted to training and developing young minds, black minds at Howard University. Howard being the seat of black intellectual power, the black ivory tower. He spent his, all his life at Howard. And this, to me, is a remarkable thing. There have been many famous black professors who started at Howard, ended up at Harvard, Stanford, and all this. Nyang remained devoted to Howard University. And this, to me, Nyang is an extraordinary human being who insists on remaining ordinary and inspiring others. Now, I'm not supposed to speak too much. I know so much about Nyang, I could spend the whole evening telling you about him. So I'm just going to read a poem, which is what, I, what I'm asked to do. And the poem I've written is titled, There Was a Man from the Gambia. There was a man from the Gambia. He went to St. Augustine's High School, Hampton University, and Virginia. He studied under Irish Catholic priests who taught him the Bible and Latin, mathematics, science, literature, and other riddles. There was a man from Lehman Street he has known Half Dye and Buckle Street. These are streets in the Gambia. Half Dye, which is an area of Banjul where half of the people died because of a cholera epidemic a long time ago. So it's called now Half Dye area. So he was known in Half Dye and Buckle Street. He learned the Quran from famous Gambian teachers. On the, and the teachers were Partijan, Tafsir Dembandau, Pake Bakor, Sidi Taban, those great preachers. He was gifted in school in both Quranic and Nazarene education. He learned the Arabic alphabet and English by dictation, translating the Quran into Wolof through the process of Wolofal. He became good at it in a nutshell, even triumphal. Of the law of the Greeks, he learned from Professor Edward Coleman, minoring in philosophy, absorbing the medieval scholars and the enlightenment. He moved to the University of Virginia to join the Jeffersonian tradition. From Hampton's Freed's people law, he joined the landed gentry's firmament. There was a man from the Gambia. He studied in the 60s America in Virginia. Witnessing the civil rights movement, he became a Pan-Africanist, <coughs> admiring Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin King, Carmichael, those great activists. He admired Nkrumah for his bold vision and mentored young Africans to dream a continent of united mission. He was a brilliant explorer of ideas and an engaging speaker, loved to toy with ideas, turn, counter turn, this truth seeker. There was a man from the Gambia. I will not name his name. He's not from Zambia. He has written many articles and books on Islam and African politics, taught at several universities, responded to friends and critics. Of his many virtues is his selfless humility, caring for others already ready to serve humanity. He always time, has time for ordinary and important, 
folk gave each his respect, empowered the weak to talk. There was a man from the Gambia. I will not name his name. He's not from Zambia. He served diligently as the Gambia's deputy ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Of that stint, he learned the dribbles of politics in the Gambia. He loved Howard University, that seat of African-American intellectual power. Loved to train young blind minds in this black ivory tower. Opportunities galore, he shone them always for Howard. Grooming to success young black minds, he made his life mission and reward. There was a man from the Gambia, I will now name his name, our own Professor Nyang. A distinguished speaker, I have even called him the younger Mazrui. <laughs> and if Professor Ali doesn't object, I would even call him Professor Suleiman Mazrui. <laughs> <laughs> Known across the continent, from Egypt to Nigeria, he's a shining intellectual, this Promethean luminary from the Gambia. Delighted we are gathered here to celebrate his thought and works. I invoke the ghost of Leopold Senghor. Please join me with an applause. Play all the Gambian musical instruments in our cultural repertoire. Play the kora, the sabar, the riti, the balafon. Let us celebrate this Gambian intellectual etch in our memoir. Let us celebrate this scholar, our own Professor Nyan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tijan. Now, um, we have a presentation by students of...